The, Dr. Anthony Fauci has certainly talked about this warning of premature reopening of the economy, risking a triggering of an outbreak that will not be able to be controlled. So we'll be watching that very closely. Additionally, this is the big question that you raised at the top of today's show. Would you volunteer to be deliberately infected with the coronavirus? It's a serious question. Thousands of people have signed up on OneDaySooner.org to volunteer to be a part of so-called human challenge trials. The hope is that by purposely giving some people the virus followed by a potential vaccine, it could substantially, substantially decrease the amount of time it takes for a vaccine to become available. Josh Morrison is the co-founder of the One Day Sooner movement. Josh, thanks for joining us here today. We got to dive right in. Why are the challenge trials so important and have they ever been done before with other diseases? So challenge trials have been done uh, for a number of different diseases, including malaria, uh, dengue fever, cholera, typhoid, and flu. The drug Tamiflu, for example, was developed with challenge trials, as was the malaria vaccine, uh, RTS, S, that's being deployed in Africa right now. What a challenge trial does is because you're deliberately exposing about normally something like 100 volunteers to infection and then observing them in isolation, you can find out much more quickly whether a vaccine might work than a traditional trial, which might have you know thousands or even tens of thousands of volunteers uh, and would, would be observing people in the normal course of, of daily life, where maybe 1% or 2% of them are going to get infected over a period of maybe six months. This is a super interesting topic here. So the difference between COVID-19 and diseases like malaria or cholera is, and, and the regular flu, we might add, is that they have effective treatments. And of course, coronavirus does not, at least yet. The guiding principle mm -hmm. of medicine is do no harm. So aren't there serious mm -hmm. ethical issues with injecting live humans with a virus that could potentially kill them? Mm -hmm. And so first of all, you know, no one would ever want to understate the risks of COVID-19 um, or that, that volunteers would, would be facing. But that said, you know, there's two things. One is that there's going to be some time taken to develop these challenge trials. There's a few steps you need to do first. And we don't know by the time the challenge trials are ready what treatments are going to exist or what they're going to look like. So it's very important that we do those preparations now because we don't want to be in a situation in six months where we say, oh, we would really love there to be challenge trials, but we have to wait another six months for them to be useful. The second thing I would mention is even apart from, from treatments, and there are some promising treatments now like remdesivir or there is just a paper in The Lancet about a combination therapy that looks promising. If you look at the risks of getting COVID-19 for the young, healthy group that would participate in challenge trials, they're roughly on a par with childbirth or uh, with kidney donation. So again, significant risks, and we're not understating that, but these are risks we commonly allow people to accept normally. And given the tremendous possible value, we think it's worth accepting them in this case if we need to. Some folks have referred to this as playing Russian roulette with people's lives. What do you say to that? Well, I think if you look at the numbers, you know, Russian roulette, that's that's a one in six chance of death or something like that. Um, if you look at, you know, people age 20 to 29, according to our best available data, uh, you know, that's that includes healthy and unhealthy people. The chance of dying from COVID-19 if you're infected is about one in 3,300, not one in six. So that's incredibly different. And that's, again, healthy and unhealthy people. My understanding is that about 90% of people who are hospitalized with the disease have uh, some pre-existing condition. So again, you know, that's not to say that that risk is a, is a non-existent risk, but it's also a type of risk which is something we normally accept and not anything like Russian roulette or anything very dangerous like that. And so have you been in touch with either the NIH or any of the companies or researchers that are currently working on vaccines? Yes, uh, yeah, it's a great question. And so we've, we've had talks with experts at the NIH and the WHO and uh, at least three of the different, say three of the different vaccine manufacturers that have products in, uh, in human testing right now and what I would say is that generally, um, there's definitely interest in this, and especially the momentum, especially lately, the momentum is moving towards using them. So just to give uh, a couple examples, the WHO recently came out with an ethics report that 
uh, anticipates a lot of scenarios under which you would use human challenge trials. And, you know, I think that ethics report isn't perfect. And we made some suggestions uh, that weren't included that we think were, would, would have significantly improved it. But I think it was a great start. And also, if you look at the NIH, and there was a recent paper published in Science where one of the NIH's bioethics experts, Annette Ridd, was one of the lead authors. And that paper also laid out criteria where there could be an ethically acceptable human challenge trial for COVID-19. So I would say, you know, it's it's not um, universal acclaim or immediate, you know, oh, we need challenge trials right away from every possible corner. But the, the message today is immensely different, immensely more positive than what the, the public message was a month ago. And I do think these major entities are, are becoming more and more comfortable. The last thing I'll mention is, and this isn't a group that we've been in touch with, um, but uh, the other day in the Financial Times, um, an executive at Johnson & Johnson said that they would be interested in using challenge trials if they were run um, by a, a reputable uh, trialist, be like the NIH or something like that. While we have you here, the form of compensation, what would that look like? So I think that that's to be determined. And we at One Day Sooner think that's a, a really a secondary consideration. And the issue needs to be, should these challenge trials go forward at all? And how should they be conducted? And as long as volunteers are treated fairly, uh, you know, the, the compensation, that's something that can be figured out later. You know, that's really, when we, when we do our town halls with volunteers and we do our interviews with volunteers, it's basically something that's never brought up, except when we ask our volunteers, you know, what, what should the compensation be? Because we always get that question in the media. And honestly, the most common answer is, oh, well, you know, there shouldn't be compensation. I think that's a little unreasonable. I think that, um, you know, for example, lost wages, uh, need to be reimbursed, and you know any long-term harms that could happen to a volunteer need to be need to be compensated, and, and people need to be taken care of. Um, we've also talked to volunteers about the idea that some volunteers might want to give their compensation to charity or something like that. But I, I think that's a conversation for for later. And as long as volunteers aren't doing it primarily for financial motivations, and having talked to the people who've signed up, I, I feel quite certain that's the case. Um, we, we think of compensation as, as really a, a secondary question. Okay, I just think of this as the hazards pay, hazard pay, um, the ultimate form of hazard pay. Josh Morrison, mm -hmm. executive director and co-founder of One Day Sooner. Thank you so much for joining us. Keep us updated on the trials.